Areena. It's getting colder out there, but our election coverage is heating up. Do we always have to reference the weather in these intros? Only when we can't think of anything better. Well, thankfully this one's finished and the podcast can start. Hello and welcome to All Points North, the podcast where the grass is always greener. I'm Egan Richardson and joining me on the show this week is Ronan Brown. Welcome, Ronan. Thank you, Egan. Great to be here. Now, this week, as every week this spring, we are focused on the local elections. It's a hectic campaign and there's a lot going on. If you're a candidate in the elections, you should be getting ready now. And I believe the ULA election compass will soon be open for candidates to fill in their answers. Yes, along with all the other election compasses. So if you are a candidate, make sure you do that, as it's an important way to reach voters. It certainly is. Now, this week we're continuing our series of party leader interviews with the Green Party chair, Maria Ohisalo. She's been in charge of the party since June 2019, when she also became Interior Minister. And as ever, we recorded this remotely, and it did feel a little bit awkward at the start, as these remote calls tend to be. But our first question was about remote working. How does it feel to do so much of it? How has she adjusted to it? And things like that. Only it turned out she doesn't do a great deal of working from home, as interior ministers mostly have to be on the spot for their meetings. But she did say that her party is very keen on promoting remote work. And in that sense, the pandemic has sparked a bit of a revolution. Actually, in the government, uh, the the Greens and the Centre Party has been the parties that have been promoting and talking uh, pro uh, remote working quite a lot because we see that there is a huge potential to move our working life or or, uh, make it better because there are many people who would like to work from their summer cottages for example but it hasn't been possible uh, earlier so now the Finnish society has shown that we can do it. This has been one of the best tools to tackle the whole virus and uh, many people really like it. Of course, I have to say there are also people who see that uh, meetings personally are essential and we all know that we do miss our colleagues in, in many ways. So we need to find the balance here. So I guess the Greens want to reduce commuting time and emissions. And the Centre Party are keen for people to be able to live in the countryside if they want to, even even if their job is elsewhere. Yes, it is interesting to see how the pandemic has meshed with political positions in some ways. But this is a local election podcast for local election people. So we started the interview with some questions about local politics. So you're Finland's interior minister. You're also your party's leader and you're a Helsinki city councillor. So do you really have time for all of those roles? I do have time, but unfortunately, I have to say, when the COVID pandemic started, the Helsinki City Council is often meeting on Wednesday, or always meeting on Wednesdays, every second Wednesday, and also the government negotiations have been nearly every same Wednesday. So that has been problematic for me, but I'm really uh, motivated to continue my work as a city councillor. Also, I was able to work from 17 to 19 these years. I was sitting in the uh, Helsinki City Board and uh, I found the work really interesting and I could really influence the city a lot. So I would like to continue my work as a councillor now and I'm candidating for the third time now for the Helsinki City Council. I I'm sure that I will find more time for that after we are also in a better stage with this COVID crisis. Okay, Um, your party's theme for this election is the 15-minute municipality, Uh, I believe it was reported over the weekend. Um, Could you explain uh, briefly what does that mean in practice in Finland? Uh, Actually, our slogan, if you would put it, is tomorrow... Finland is green and uh, this combines all of our uh, major topics from education to to basic essential services to to climate change uh, work, tackling climate change and uh, um, biodiversity loss and uh, making 
municipalities uh, take, for example, tackling poverty as one of their key goals. Um, but uh, yes, we're also talking about this 15 minute city um, or municipality, which means which comes from um, international discussions related to city planning. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, we would build our cities or municipalities so that uh, you could be able to use your bike or car or uh, your commute traffic uh, to be able to reach the schools, the stores, the the homes, the um, essential services you need in your everyday life. And actually, we know that in quite many cities, for example, I just talked with my fellow green councillor from, from Kajaani, and uh, she is living already this 15-minute life in, in Kajaani, uh, in Kainu. And this is definitely not a question only for larger cities, for, but it's, I, I think it's a way of doing your city planning in order to make the life easier for everybody. Okay, so everything should be within like 15 minutes. But yes. then I want to ask about Malmi Airport, because the Helsinki is planning to build a lot of houses there, like thousands of new apartments. But it's quite a way out from the city centre. I mean, at the moment it takes, I think, 43 minutes to get there, um, to get from the Parliament building to Malmi Airport, for instance. And that will get a bit quicker as transport links improve but it's it's not going to get close to 15 minutes. So I just wanted to ask if, if Helsinki is maybe building houses in the wrong area. Shouldn't they be building a bit closer to the centre? It's not only about the how you build your uh, your new apartments, but it's also, of course, about how you plan the collective traffic. For example, there will be a new tram uh, so that you, it could take you to the train and we need to build everything so that everything clicks together. And of course, not everybody needs to come to the city center. We need to build these kinds of areas where you have in around that 15 minutes, you, you can reach your school, your working place, your relatives, your stores in that area. We don't need to say that you would from the other side of Helsinki come to the city center of Helsinki in 15 minutes. The idea is also built these uh, surroundings. We've reported on the unequal distribution of councillors in Helsinki and elsewhere in recent months. The problem is that elections are citywide, so people vote for the most popular candidates wherever they're from. That means wealthier neighbourhoods get lots of councillors and poorer suburbs have fewer. And we've also reported that this has an impact on spending decisions as research has shown that councillors try to avoid making cuts to services near where they live. We had a simple question for the Green Leader. What should be done about it? A general issue in politics is that uh, we see uh, social segregation. We see uh, gaps in in who is making the decisions in politics. Uh, When there was BBC News coming to Finland and interviewing the five leaders of our government parties and and telling the story of uh, a real equality happening now in Finland, I said that there is still a problem that we as uh, educated white females uh, are representing equality. Not It's not ready yet. We need to see uh, people from, from different eth- ethnic backgrounds, from different socioeconomic situations in politics. More. And this is also, I consider it my task as a party leader to ask a lot of people to join politics, everybody to join politics and say that this is also your thing. Politics is what we do to our society together. And especially in the municipality elections, we are uh, talking about our everyday life, how we plan the city, how we have these services around us, how we can move around the city how this is a good city for each and everybody, despite the, the size of your uh, wallet and, uh, and your social background. So um, this is a problem in politics in general, I think. And now in the Helsinki elections, obviously, the Greens were building our list, which is becoming the best list ever uh, in our history. And we are obviously aiming to become the mayor uh, party 
So uh, Anni Sinnemäki is our candidate for the mayor post and uh, I guess it could be uh, historically the first uh, big city where the green mayor is leading and I would definitely want to show the world the message that uh, we have a green person taking care of uh, a Nordic welfare state capital, um, Helsinki, and uh, especially a person who sees these uh, social gaps also and wants to, to tackle these, uh, that uh, she's a candidate who wants to see everybody involved in politics also. Okay, and um, what are some ways that we could, or you could tackle that unequal distribution of councillors in the city? Well, I think the responsibility is at our shoulders as party leaders, as, as party uh, members, as candidates. I've asked every candidate also to personally ask their relatives and friends and uh, acquaintances that, uh, hey, I'm candidating, would you also like to candidate? Everybody is needed. We need your uh, knowledge and uh, enthusiasm to, to change this city and not only Helsinki, but around uh, Finland. So um, okay. this is something, and, and also I think media has a good place to, to help in this, that we are telling about the elections to everybody. Uh, we are saying that uh, you don't have to be a uh, um, citizen in order to vote in these elections. And, okay, and so we will do our best to do that. We, we will <laughs> yes. We're just try and cover the elections a lot. But I just want to um, uh, ask, uh, because you, you say you want the, the more candidates and people from different backgrounds, but it, there's clearly a disparity between people from poorer districts and people from wealthier districts. They're going to have a disparity in their, their budget for the election, the, the people, their networks, how powerful the people in their networks are. Um, and in Helsinki, we have like a broad swathe of Eastern Helsinki, which has very few councillors. Now you're from Eastern Helsinki, you grew up there. Um, would you think about maybe introducing a ward system or districts or some, some kind of electoral system which guarantees a more geographical spread? Uh, I think I would, if there are researchers who could make a suggestion about this, uh, why not? I would go through that and I would see that. Uh, one thing also um, is that we are telling that and, and we need as a politicians to, to say that politics is not happening only in the elections. Politics is happening between the elections, especially now the next four years we need to go around the city to meet people. For example, I, when we started at this government, we had this uh, library tour where all the ministers would go around Finland to libraries to meet local people to talk about the governmental program. That, okay, people had voted us in the elections, but now the five parties came together and uh, put together this program. And these discussions were really lively. For example, I went to Itäkeskus and Vuosaari libraries and uh, the place was packed. People were so excited about the new government's program and I would definitely love to continue this. Unfortunately, this uh, pandemic situation puts these elections into a really uh, difficult place that we need to have these kinds of meetings with people but there is a threshold some people are not participating like, like this but maybe in the corridors of prisma and city market we would be able to meet people but now we can go there so this definitely is a challenge for our democracy okay you're very welcome to come on the show between elections as well we, we will definitely sort that out in, in the future uh, so you can reach our audience of, of um, foreigners in finland but um, about that audience, a lot of them uh, ask us uh, about language teaching in schools because many native Eng English speakers, when they move to Finland, um, their children obviously speak very good English. They, they, they speak it at home. It's basically a first language for them. Um, and many children also have to speak it, have to look, sit in English class at school uh, because kids now get a foreign language from the first grade. But in most schools, in Helsinki, it's English. Um, do you have any plans to change that? Do you is, do you have any ideas about how we could how we could fix that situation? Well, in generally, learning languages is uh, 
in this globalized and more and more globalizing world a skill that we need to teach everybody we need to show that okay as as actually green councillors for example mari holopainen who is also candidating and is our member of parliament right now she has made these uh, um, suggestions that which we are now putting into reality that from the first grades you can already start uh, language uh, le learning the new languages um, i think we should have a variety of different languages where children could choose uh, it should not depend on the school where you are, not on the area you are living in, but the opportunities should be for everybody. And um, yes, this is, uh, well, many researchers say that learning languages and mathematics is probably the best tools to uh, be surviving in the future's working life. But it's also a question about, um, obviously, about integration, how we... Uh, take everybody uh, into this society that uh, we can we can show that, for example, people who move here with their families or are born in in families where there are multiple languages, it's also about their integration. How our kids in general uh, speak languages and and can meet different people with different languages. So it's a huge integration question in general. Right, um, and one like the the acknowledged leader in this is in Finland is uh, Tampere. Would you um, think about taking on their uh, their policies of reducing the minimum numbers for a, a different language class um, in in most of the schools? Um, yeah, why not? Definitely. Uh, I just actually met the mayor and the. Uh, deputy mayor last week and and uh, we have good connections there so why not that last topic is one we have covered here at all points north and it's one that's close to a lot of people hopefully politicians will find a way to stop english speaking kids getting bored in their english classes we've also heard a lot about home care allowance recently after one think tank linked the benefit to lower employment among immigrant women yeah that ava report really did spark a reaction and it's true that home care allowance does mean women stay home for longer, and that affects employment and earnings later on. But among our audience, it really hit home for a lot of people, because for many women, it's not really about wanting to stay home. They'd like to be in work, but employers don't value their skills and experience. And as we reported recently, brain waste is a problem in Finland. So we looked at the question from that angle. On that specific relation to immigrant women here, because uh, they're part of our audience, we do hear from them a lot that it's not really, they don't choose to stay home. They, 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 they would rather go out and work. And many people who move here have degrees and experience that, that are simply not recognised by Finnish employers. And we have seen, um, because we're talking about research, we have seen research that for instance, people with Somali names have to send many times more applications to get an interview than somebody with a white Finnish name. So it seems to many people in our audience that the problem is not the benefits that are paid, it's the discrimination among employers. Do you think Finland has the right tools to fight that discrimination? We, especially in Helsinki, have started this new example or a tool where in the process when you're searching for a job, we're looking for candidates, we would take away the names, the ages, uh, the genders and so on, so that this would make it easier for all the people to be able to come to the interviews and, and succeed in these processes. This is one tool and uh, there has been good uh, examples that this has been working. So I think this is a model that should be put uh, around put in use around the Finland around the whole country but definitely we have a lot to do in order to get everybody involved uh, social subsidies is one part then one part is how we develop our language uh, teaching in general as I mentioned when you're coming to this country you would need to get the best education right away and you would be able to go there uh, many times, not not only here and there. So language, social subsidies, these examples were what I mentioned about the anonymous recruiting. So we need all these kinds of tools. 
Okay, I, I want to focus on the people that, that because we, the, the research was for identical CVs, so it's people with the same language skills, the same experience, all of that. We we have interviewed the Ombudsman for Equal Opportunities, Kirisi Pimea, a couple of years ago, or last year. No, not last year, 2019. We're still early in the year, I get confused. Um, she told us that a rejected applicant has no information about why another candidate is better and that there was a report to Parliament in 2018 that proposed that people should have the right to an explanation of recruitment decisions in the same way that it's now possible to get one on the basis of disability or gender. That was in 2018. Uh, we realised you, you didn't you only entered government in 2019. But do you think that's an option for Finland? Is that is that something we should add to the toolkit to fight discrimination in hiring? Definitely. Why not? I think, as I mentioned, some examples we need but only, not only those, but on, on top of that, a lot of new tools. And uh, in general, from other countries, we have a lot to learn. As I mentioned, or I'm talking quite a lot in the public debate about the fact that Finland is aging. We're going to need more people to work here. We are not doing very well in, in many sectors. We need more people to come here. So we also need to be able to show that this society is open for everybody and all the tools we can use, we need to use. And we were keen to ask Ohisalo how she sees her portfolio. Interior ministers are charged with border control and security, which are not traditionally the most green talking points. She's had a lot on her plate, but she says she came into the job keen to implement a fresh approach. We asked her what was the plan when she took the job. Well, actually, the first idea that came to my mind when I heard that this is the portfolio that we got is that social policy is the best security policy. This has been something that I I have been saying this for years as a social politician and and with a doctor's degree in, in sociology. I was really excited about coming into this field where when I talk to policemen, rescue people, at rescue services, they always tell the same story that people who end up doing crimes or becoming victims quite often are seen in statistics that they probably their socioeconomic situation is not as well as in the majority of Finland have or their education levels or income levels or the levels of social support they have or social networks around them are weak or low. And this is something where I felt that I could combine my previous knowledge and and my work as a researcher. And the research that I did was related to to poverty and social exclusion. And I really felt that this field is something that I already somehow know. And I have felt the same now nearly two years soon. And I'm still happy that we were able to get this portfolio. For example, today we just got uh, a research about uh, the changes done into immigration law, which has actually made it more difficult for people who are coming here as asylum seekers, that Finland has actually breached some international conventions or or are not following the basic lines of respecting human rights in in all the uh, decisions. So... I got this research, which now works as a tool for us in this ministry also to develop our policies so that we would respect human rights, basic rights in in all the decision making we're doing here. So these were some of the reasons I really thought that this is also very green post, although it's the first, I guess I'm the first green female minister of the interior in the world. So it's something new, but I also wanted to show that our party is ready to take all the responsibilities in this society and one day even the prime minister post. One of your responsibilities, as you mentioned, as interior minister is is Finland's police force. So we reported last year that trust in the Finnish police is is slipping among the among the general public. What do you think is causing this and, and what can be done about it? We actually saw from the police barometer that's done every, uh, is it every second year or every year? I'm not sure now. But anyways, the newest research we got in the summer was telling that especially in the minority groups, the trust into into our police forces has gone lower. That is a development that we should stop we should be able to show that the Finnish police force is is the best police for everybody 
in the whole world because we know that people in general trust police quite a lot, probably more than in any country in the world. And we are doing a lot of work in order to get, for example, the police forces to look like the whole Finnish society is looking like, so that people from different ethnic backgrounds could apply to become police, men and women. We would be able to show that police is always there, uh, not depending on the area where you live. Police is always there if you need police. And uh, this is something that we have been able to improve that there are more resources coming to police all the time. For example, in those areas where we don't have as many police men and women, we have been able to increase the numbers over 60 so that more people are coming into these areas. Like in the countryside, for example, where where the situation hasn't been that good. Yeah, um, because last summer we also reported on a study. It showed that uh, Finland's police, border guards and customs officers engaged in ethnic discrimination and profiling. And one sort of aspect of that could be that there's a problem in that the police officers that people see on the street are a pretty homogenous group. You mentioned that just there, but are you moving fast enough, do you think, in tackling that? I can tell that this is not the first government that has tried to make police look more like the whole society. So no, we're not moving enough fast. We should be able to show that police is for everybody more and more so that everybody would feel that I I could also see my future as a policeman or a woman. So there is a lot to do and the police academy here is, is improving all the time, but we are pushing things in a good way, I think. We're improving. For example, more and more females are all the time applying. So the numbers are are getting better in that sense. But when it comes to different ethnic backgrounds, for example, we still have a lot of work there. As she's the Green Party leader, we did ask about climate change. Now, the thing here is that many climate activists regard the government's actions as inadequate. They say ministers are not doing enough to stop catastrophic climate change before it becomes inevitable, which experts believe would be around 2030. And one particular problem has been peat burning, which is dear to the centre party, but which Greens say has to stop. This year, the Greens increased taxes on peat, but did not end subsidies. And that's an ongoing dispute within government. In the governmental programme, you set the goal and then the next four years you find the solutions to put your goals into reality and make it reality. So obviously inside the government we're all the time, sometimes we're not agreeing on on all the tools, but even sometimes when we are disagreeing, we tend to find the solution uh, which takes us into that path. And for example, when it comes to burning peat, we have a good goal that by the 30s we would halve the burning of uh, Pete, at least, at least is an uh, this is a different uh, this is an uh, important word from the governmental program because it means that we're now making this floor pricing to Pete, which means that it would take us on on that road. Uh, we were able to increase the taxation in in Pete, and that has already actually showed in the field that in the future. So maybe the signal effect that the governmental uh, decisions made was even bigger than many people thought. And I'm personally happy about the fact that now the industry finally sees that, okay, this is not the future energy solution. We need to find clean energy solutions when it comes to solar power, wind power, some parts nuclear power. We need that as part of our clean energy solutions tool uh, back and, and also warm um, heat from the ground and all these new uh, solutions we are going to need. So we're taking decisions all the time. Now one big decision is how to make our traffic carbon neutral and uh, by the 30s we are also halving uh, the whole pollution from the traffic sector. So we are now finding the solutions and I'm, I'm personally happy that we are sticking into that good goal in the governmental program. 
So this was a theme to the climate approach here. Ohisalo emphasised business and responsibility and market mechanisms to fight climate change with the government setting the targets. And we did follow up on aviation. Finnair has one of the most ambitious carbon neutral goals as a company. Obviously, it's a company that we cannot, as government, tell everything that they are doing. But we have a program that government-owned companies should follow. And we, as government, see that Finnair's goals are in the right path. If we compare to any other aviation companies, these goals are good and they need to follow these goals. And uh, obviously, Finland is still not ready when it comes to people moving around with trains, for example. Our train networks are not ready yet in order to take people fast around the country and this is something Finland has uh, the Greens have have been promoting actively that we could also put more effort into developing our train system for example and fast train connections around the whole country. Okay so you say Finnair is one of the best climate policies in relation to aviation as a whole but aviation as a whole according to most climate scientists is very problematic in the way it it operates Um, and also in the Finnair plan there is a lot of talk of carbon sinks and um, sequestration which is uh, an unproven technology and is not not entirely proven to work do you think it's credible when people like Greta Thunberg are saying that we need real zero not net zero where you 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 rely on unproven technologies and, and carbon sinks that we are we're also looking at those technologies in Finland. When it comes to, for example, new investments to Finland in the forest sector, people tend to ask me as a Green Party leader, which project I would say yes or no to. And as a politician, I cannot say that something is yes or no, but my task is to see the whole big picture. And my task is to say that If we are going to follow our governmental goals when it comes to carbon sinks or when it comes to decreasing our carbon footprint in general, if we are not ready to move fast enough in the traffic sector, for example, then we need to move faster in some other sectors. So I'm all the time looking at the whole big picture. And for example, now when we're going into the government's halfway negotiations uh, this spring, the frame negotiations, as we say, here we're going to go through the whole big picture of climate policies. Are we getting enough decrease in, in our carbon footprint? If we're not getting there, then we need to find new tools again in order to make uh, our policies better functioning. And and uh, it's a work that should be done in all the sectors all the time. We cannot only look at what's happening in, in traffic or what's happening in construction field, but we need to see all the sectors together. And when it comes to aviation in general, there are technological solutions, electronic solutions, biofuels, but these are not going to solve the big picture, definitely not. I think the whole pandemic has shown us that maybe the prices in that whole sector will go up for a long time and probably people will also find cheaper and more nice ways of traveling, for example, with trains. There is also a quite big movement around Finland. In Finnish we say maata pitkin. So people who want to travel, especially without using uh, aviation or planes. So I think this is also a cultural change that we are facing. And this was the point at which my laptop died a death. It was the black screen of nothingness for me, although the audio did still work. Um, So I didn't quite get a chance to press harder on climate change. Apologies for that. But I think we did get some answers there. Lastly, of course, we had to ask about the coronavirus crisis, which has dominated the last year. For this section, we focused on testing at the border. The Ministry of Social Affairs and Health is building that legislation. And through the whole year, the health authorities have been able to maximize the testing capacity all the time. The numbers that we were talking 
last summer we were talking about a couple of thousands of tests per day and now we're like uh, talking whole different numbers so we have or the health uh, authorities have built a whole new system related to this testing and analyzing the uh, samples and so on and especially the municipalities who are responsible of the border for example Vanta city is responsible for the Helsinki Vanta airport so um, they are especially putting more and more experts there so more and more experts could test people and could guarantee people Uh, so this is a system that hasn't existed in that big scale as it now is Um, If you look back over the last year, is there anything in particular you would have done differently in in the handling of the pandemic? There are always things that one could do better. There has been quite many research done in the whole managing of the pandemic situation and and the crisis. And I guess we can all learn from those. Um, Something that is always something that needs to be improved is how ministries are working better together. Because we have issues that are dropping into many different sectors there is not only one responsible ministry so we need to work better together and we need to be more prepared in the future crises like this because these will become more everyday life we've seen pandemics before we see it now and we will see it also in the future and our task is to to build Finland so crisis prepared that we are prepared in the crisis, which could be like hybrid crisis at the same time. They would happen many different things at the same time. And for example, we were forced to shut down or close the schools last year, last spring. And uh, nowadays we know that that was something we probably didn't need to do because the ways the everyday life is now uh, built in in the school day is more secured and and children can live without fear of uh, getting infected so so this is something that we have learned as a government definitely so that was mario ohisalo telling you about the greens approach to this april's local elections and that was the second of our election interviews and of course the remaining seven are on the way in the next few weeks So please don't be shy. This is your chance to ask politicians questions you want answered. Give us a shout on WhatsApp via plus 358-44-421-0909. And I guess now it's time for our news roundup. Yes, and the trial began in Helsinki this week of three teenagers accused of murdering a 16-year-old boy. An ULE investigation into the case found that the boy had been the victim of bullying for many years and did not get sufficient help from his school or from authorities. Officials say the local elections might have to be postponed due to concerns that people under quarantine might not be able to vote. Parties don't want to move the poll, but a final decision has to come this month. And a fresh survey found the sharpest decline in life satisfaction ever recorded among young adults aged 15 to 25, with girls in general and boys with an immigrant background being most dissatisfied. Foreign Minister Pekka Harvisto went to St. Petersburg to meet his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. He condemned the conviction of opposition leader Alexei Navalny on trumped-up charges and the expulsion of EU diplomats who attended pro-Navalny demonstrations as observers. Meanwhile, some 60% of Finnish respondents to a recent poll on the EU said they thought the union was moving in the wrong direction, which was the highest level of dissatisfaction among all member states. And in more EU news, the government won a confidence vote in Parliament called to protest at the forthcoming Coronavirus Recovery Fund. The Finns party, Christian Democrats and Movement Now called the confidence vote as they say the recovery plan makes Finland pay other countries' debt. Finland also announced this week that it will be seeking a seat on the UN Human Rights Council when the next three-year term begins in 2022. Prime Minister Sanna Marin said in a campaign video that it was a further demonstration of the country's commitment to a human rights-based foreign and security policy. 
And finally, a much-anticipated family leave reform introduced the so-called use-it-or-lose-it model. Under the new system, mothers will lose some of their paid time off, while fathers will get more. Parental leave as a whole will increase by one month, but only if parents split it more evenly. And I think that's about all we have time for this week. I'm hoping that this weekend I'll get to watch a couple of things I've been planning to catch up on. How about you, Ronan? Do you have any special plans? No, not so much, but I am hoping to go cross-country skiing at some point as the conditions are pretty much perfect for it right now. They are indeed, and it's good that we have so many wonderful COVID-safe activities to talk about in this section of the show. Uh, All that's left to say is thanks to you, Ronan. Thanks, Egan. And thanks to our producer and audio editor, Mark B. Odom, to our audio engineer, Anders Johansson, and of course to you, our audience. Don't forget to check out our website at wiley.fi slash news, and of course to subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for listening, and join us again next week. Bye! Bye!